Dry. Filler. Dead. Genshin Impact players have always bemoaned these low-content patches like 4.5. But think back just a couple months ago. Patch 4.4 was Lantern Rite, normally one of the most exciting patches of the year. And yet, the community's reaction is best described as whelmed. Not over or under, just whelmed. I mean, okay, actually, the community's reaction was full of drama, with a bunch of people being angry about the game for one reason or another, be it rewards, lack of content, character kit designs, or being mad at each other for just completely different reasons. Lantern Rite is normally a pretty hype patch, the story is normally fun, and for the last three years it's come with a new zone to explore. So the lackluster reception of patch 4.4 was a deviation from the norm. So I've been wondering, is Genshin stagnating? The answer is simple. It depends on who you are. No matter who you are, if you're an online member of the Genshin community, you've likely felt the brewing discontent among players. Gamers appear to be less happy with and trusting of Hoyoverse than they were a few years ago. We can see this in how new features, patches, and characters are received. The feelings you hold toward another person or company or brand directly affect the way that you perceive their actions. While someone is in your good graces, you're more likely to believe that their actions are for your benefit or well justified, or you're more likely to give them the benefit of the doubt if something seems off. If someone you dislike does the same thing, you're more likely to interpret their behavior as hostile, or in the case of a business, predatory. For Genshin, my favorite recent example is the new Chronicled Wish banner. The community seems to hate this thing, and view it as quite predatory, even though Hoyo obviously tried to incorporate a lot of player feedback into the banner and make it something that people would actually want to pull on. Weapon gotcha rates? Now a 50-50 instead of the scam 33% rate of the normal weapon banner. Permanent characters like Mona and Jean? Now guaranteeable. Forgotten weapons like Hunter's Path and Beacon of the Reed Sea? Up for grabs once again. You can even lose your 50-50 to a different limited character on the banner, when they didn't have to do that at all. They could have just stuck us with the standard gotcha pool while using this as a way to increase the number of reruns out at one time. The characters on it are old, but for people who like those characters and save a guarantee, it's not bad. I would rather roll for a character or their cons on this banner than the normal one. But despite these player-friendly decisions, the community didn't trust it. So if players are unhappy with Hoyo, where did it come from? A big part of that, in Genshin at least, in recent times, obviously has to do with rewards, which evidently have a pretty big impact on how the player base perceives the game. If the devs had just given us more than what we'd gotten in years past, or even just something different like a free 4-star skin selector, or a selectable standard 5-star weapon, then the biggest controversies likely would not have come. It is hard to be excited about the game's anniversary or the Chinese New Year holiday event when the rewards are not significantly different from other patches and are also unchanging from year to year. Rewards are predictable now. There's a formula. I'll have a... A 10 pull. How original. And with... A 4-star leeway selector. Daring today, aren't we? So Genshin is definitely stagnating in the rewards department, and it's a bad look when the sister game can give away free, strong 5 stars and extra pulls every patch. It makes Genshin seem a lot less exciting in comparison. But rewards aren't Genshin's core content, which I think is a much more interesting place to consider whether or not Genshin is stagnating. Genshin's rewards suck. But if all the players were truly happy with the state of the game, then the rewards would matter a lot less. People would be happily playing the game instead of engaging in comment thread PvP. Although, they'll probably end up doing that for their favorite characters anyways. I don't know that it's a common line of thought, but I have seen some people say recently that characters aren't content. This is so wrong. Characters are the most important content in the game. Don't believe me? Believe Hoyoverse CEO Tsai Hao Yu. Characters are one of the most desired content for our players. Like any gacha game, Genshin would be nothing if not for its characters. Are Genshin's characters' designs stagnating? No, Genshin has great characters, some of the best in the industry. But the slow pacing of their releases, combined with some questionable balance decisions, has reduced a lot of the hype that used to come with every new character release. Things feel less exciting now. Let's explore why. Genshin 1.0 released with a roster of 22 characters, and in that same presentation I just clipped from, Tsai said they were targeting the release of 17 new characters every year. In practice, they have met or come close to that target, with a roughly 50-50 distribution of 4-star and 5-star characters. 
With a few exceptions, new 4 stars are usually too weak to be exciting, so we're left with just 8 new potentially exciting character releases per year, or about one character release every 6.5 weeks, which you'll notice lines up pretty well with Genshin's 6 week patch cycles. This is actually a pretty slow release rate for a gacha game. Compounding the slow releases, not all of Genshin's 5-star characters are even going to be exciting or interesting for all players. Most characters are not designed to appeal to everyone. Instead, there are designs put out for different segments of the player base at different times. I know that Alhatham and Kave and their interactions were meant to appeal to a certain group of people. That's fine. There are plenty of characters and scenes that were designed to appeal to players like me that do not appeal to others. Genshin is a big game, with a broad appeal and a very diverse player base. Hoyo has to try to appease as much of it as possible with their characters. But the slow releases and unreliable power levels make it a little worse. You might go months between character releases you're interested in, and sometimes, when there's a design you like, the kit just doesn't work for you. You've realized you're in the great Sumeru waifu drought. It has been three months since Hoyo released a five-star female, and there aren't any more on the horizon. You think you see an oasis in the distance. Dia, a feeling of hope flutters within you, but soon the rumors begin. Dia sucks. The 3.5 livestream comes. Standard banner. She releases. You realize she wasn't an oasis, but a mirage. Dia is obviously the biggest example here of a power level lit down. Not enough defensive utility to have a niche, but not enough DPS to be useful as a DPS. She's a great character with a great visual design, but it's hard to actually use her. Any excitement you may have had for her? Crushed. Any trust you may have had for Hoyo to reliably put out strong 5 stars? Broken. If you were really hyped for Dia, you probably aren't going to be as hyped for future characters going forward. Hoyo's tendency to play future impact makes things even worse. Characters that feel bad or underperform on release are underwhelming, even if they end up stronger later on. Yai was super hyped going into release for reasons. Three, two, one. One, two, three. <sighs> Come on. But her EM damage passive was next to useless. Kuki was okay as a healer, but didn't stand out at all otherwise when she came out. From their releases, it took months for Dendro to come out. I guess you could argue it raised excitement for Dendro, but it also opened the door for controversy with Yai, who was kinda undertuned without it. Fast forward to the current day, Chiori. I like Chiori's character and design a lot, but I'm not invested in many Geo characters, so her kit made her an easy skip. Normally, I believe in waifu over meta, but I at least want the character to have a place on my account where I can actually use them. Could there be more Geo characters she'll work with in the future? Yes, but there also might not be. It was over two years between Eula's release and a dedicated physical buffer, who's worse than Bennett, unless he's C6. You simply cannot count on future impact to buff a character. With all these factors in play, the average Genshin player in 2024 probably doesn't spend that much time being excited about upcoming releases. This is convenient for free-to-plays and low spenders who plan their pulls, but it's not great for generating and maintaining continued hype for the game. And it's kind of predictable now. It's like there's a formula. A new region will introduce a new combat mechanic. A couple of new DPS units are released who can take advantage of it. But the full potential of the mechanic is probably locked until the Archon releases. The Archon will be very strong. Their elemental skill will have permanent uptime. They will provide a strong buff to the party, usually in their elemental burst. The latter half of the annual cycle is more focused on reruns. A few region stragglers will get released with their story quests. They're probably mid-tier DPS units or niche supports to balance out the roster. If the support characters are women, their C6 will turn them into very strong on-field DPS units. The .5 patches in particular seem to release a future impact character that foreshadows the next year's mechanics, and by the time that .5 patch comes around, the community is starting to complain about dead patches, and no-name wannabe YouTubers have the time to produce video essays about the game instead of playing it. The super hype finale of the region's main story that occurred just a couple months prior is already a distant memory. The story! That's another important part of the game to consider. Is it stagnating? I know it's hard, but let's try to exercise our long-term memory a little, and think all the way back to 4.2. It was the climax of the Fontaine Archon quest, and it was very well received. General consensus online seems to be that it was the best, or at least on par with Sumeru's story. 
Genshin has done a lot to try and push story content forward. The camera usage, shooting, and angles for dialogue and cutscenes are all getting better. They even made a whole event about it. The detective minigames spread throughout the Archon Quest added a nice gameplay element to what otherwise would require almost zero interaction from the player. Was it hard or challenging? Not really. But it was a nice incentive to pay attention, be present, and think critically about what was going on. It was a nice addition. Every region's story and cast has felt truly unique. It's clear they're trying to explore different ideas and themes with each region. It's very cool, even if not everything they do lands. But the story's structure is starting to get predictable. It's like there's a formula. We get the region's core story in about three patches worth of Archon quests. Then we'll do a festival or two, hit up Lantern Rite, hang out with Dane, go on another date with the Archon, and then we'll go on summer vacation. In Hoyo's credit, there is a fair amount of variety here, but it's mostly variety in minigames. The game's most ardent players are continuously left longing for more combat content. Genshin's combat gets a bad rap because, yeah, it's super easy for late game players, and we don't have very much to do. This is a shame because Genshin's combat system is actually really good and really unique. In a recent semi ramblematic Yahtzee said something that made me think. I've been concerned that melee combat mechanics in video games are basically done innovating. Every single game now, it's light attack, heavy attack, dodge, and parry. And all I could think was, oh, oh, Genshin, it has way more going on. While each character has a limited moveset with just their normal attacks, elemental skill, and elemental burst, the team system means we have 12 abilities at our disposal at any given time. To play well, you must have knowledge of all of those abilities and how they interact with one another. The wide variety of skills and elemental reactions at the player's disposal makes Genshin's system really varied. You can wield the fantasy equivalent of Halo's rocket launcher, fight like a brawler, wield a giant JRPG claymore, or even turn the game into an auto-battler. Except there's not enough to do. They keep introducing new teams and play styles, but the Abyss is just kind of boring and uninteresting. It's not enough to make use of all the great stuff that goes into the character kits and combat system. This is probably where Genshin has stagnated the most. It's like there's a formula. Floors 11 and 12 of the Spiral Abyss get updated about once per patch. Plus we get one or two combat events. These combat events are usually very easy and have gimmicks that make things even easier. It's almost nothing, not nearly enough to keep combat interested players engaged. I do think this gets weighted pretty heavily in the community's perception, because most content creators tend towards being hardcore, highly invested players. And whether or not they're creators, the highly invested players are pretty loud in their dissatisfaction with Endgame. They pay the most attention to the game, obviously more than casuals. They are the most active online, and they are the most hurt by the stagnation in this area. From the part of the game that the devs seem to care about the least, to the one they seem to care about the most. It is worth acknowledging the truly massive scale of Genshin's exploration content and Hoyo's accomplishment in putting these huge open world expansions out with such frequency. When I talk to people who don't play Genshin, I put it like this. Imagine if Nintendo expanded Breath of the Wild with a new Zoro's Domain or Gerudo Desert twice a year. Instead, it took them six years to release Tears of the Kingdom, and they mostly reused the same map. Development on these huge open-world areas is incredibly resource-intensive. While Hoyo has gotten really good at doing it, it still must demand a lot of time and labor. And they are constantly trying to introduce new visual concepts for each area, so it never feels like we've explored the same place twice. Even when they went back to Liwei for Chen Yu Vale, they could have easily justified reusing the Liwei palette. They didn't. They chose a different direction, and probably spent thousands of extra man-hours working on the area because of it. Genshin is definitely not stagnating here, and if you play the game because you love the sense of wonder that exploring Tavat gives you, you're probably pretty happy with where the game is, and what it's doing. I think it's a little disingenuous to say the devs don't care about the game, or that they're phoning it in, or whatever. It's clear that they're trying to get better at telling the story, and put just inconceivable amounts of effort into the world. I've always loved games that let me explore. My favorite series as a kid was Pokemon, and more than anything else about those games, I loved exploring the regions. Sure, they weren't especially complicated or complex, but the sprite-based view made them feel huge, and there were tons of little paths to explore with lots of little rewards to find. It's an element of the series that they've let go, even in their desperate switch to an open world with Scarlet and Violet. Normally, I treasure the first blind playthrough of anything. How often have you wished you could go back and play a game for the first time. Imagine exploring Skyrim, or the wasteland of Fallout New Vegas, for the first time 
again. Genshin Impact is the only game I've ever played that manages to consistently give me that feeling of exploring a new world for the first time. And it's truly something special, and it's because Hoyo is constantly introducing new varied areas with each patch. But even here, there's a bit of a formula at play. Each region will be based on one or more real-life nations and cultures. They will introduce at least one new overworld traversal mechanic, along with a handful of new puzzle mechanics. They come out once per year. The summer vacation area is used to test some of the new open-world mechanics coming with the new region. Beyond that, we have no idea what a given region might look like. They put painstaking amounts of effort into making each area new and exciting and introducing new mechanics. But I get it. Not everyone likes the same thing in a video game. Too often, I've seen Genshin fans throw the this game isn't for you argument up in the air. But I don't think that's entirely fair either. As I've said, there is a lot to like in Genshin Impact. It's a game with a hugely broad appeal that seemingly chooses to ignore a pretty core group of its players, the combat enjoyers. Sometimes, I see casual gamers complain about the challenging abyss and how they don't want to feel forced to play it, or they miss out on Primo Gems. But think about all the hardcore players who have to arrange flowers or brew potions to get Primo Gems. The game can and should have content for everyone. At the same time, it's kinda hard to blame Genshin for being formulaic. Every business wishes they could find the formula for success. If you can find a formula, you get to focus on execution. Instead of spending time trying to figure out what works, you can optimize workflows and produce a lot more content as a result. But formulas don't work great at sustaining player hype. Hype requires newness, change, and variety. Genshin delivers on those elements for some players, especially exploration and story enjoyers, but not for everybody. It leaves Genshin vulnerable for competition for segments of their player base. Look at all the combat fans who are really hyped for Wuthering Waves now. So yeah, Genshin might be stagnating. Or it might not be. It ultimately comes down to you.